Am I on? Can you guys hear me? Oh, hi. OK, awesome. Well, thank you for having me in Fargo. This is my first time. It always looks like this is what I heard, right? Always like gray and cold and terrible. No? OK, all right. It gets worse. OK, ooh, OK. I'm sure it gets better. I'm sure. I heard there was a boat show this weekend, and people getting ready for the spring, right? Um, well, it's very nice to be here. Um, my, as I was just introduced, my name is Dr. Scott Scher. I am originally from the East Coast. I lived on the West Coast for a while, but now I found myself in Colorado for the last almost a year and enjoying being in the middle of the country. You know, I used to call them flyover states, but I'm one of those states now too, right? So, um, and it's really exciting that you guys have an amazing, so you can see my slides now. Okay, good. Um, you guys have an amazing uh, center that's just opening right here in the area. And I've been involved with hyperbaric medicine for the last 10 years or so. And I've seen this entire field transition from a very niche kind of thing that not many people knew about to popular press articles about hyperbaric therapy with Justin Bieber and Paris Hilton and, and LeBron James and, and kind of, it's almost shell shocking in some way to get all these calls that I get all over from, from all over the world to talk about this technology that I've loved for so many years and has so many great utilities, both from like the optimal performance, the athlete perspective, but also from things like concussion and chronic pain and stroke and, and traumatic brain injury and even potentially even some of these patients that are, and some of you maybe in the audience are know people that have symptoms after their COVID infection. So we're gonna get into it. I have, the first half of the talk is really about hyperbaric physiology, what happens in a chamber, why it's so awesome. And then the second half of the talk is more about some of the conditions that I thought might be interesting for you. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end, so please feel free. I love, that's my favorite part. I'd rather you guys talk to me than me talk to you, but you know, I'm here for this, so we're gonna do this today. And I hope this is helpful for you to understand a little bit about this amazing technology. All right, so hyperbaric oxygen therapy, the definition is, um, it's called the intermittent administration of increased inspired oxygen at increased atmospheric pressure. Who's heard of oxygen before? Anybody? Okay, good, awesome. You're all alive. You all know about oxygen. Has anybody heard about pressure before? Under pressure, maybe? Different types of pressure? So hyperbaric oxygen therapy actually started off mainly as a treatment for the bends. Has anybody heard of the bends before, decompression illness? Anybody had the bends before? Hopefully not, okay. These chambers were developed to treat the bends or decompression illness. And all the terminology that we use as a result of that is related to diving. And so we call each treatment a dive, and we use terminology that is related to diving in a lot of other ways. So just to give you some of that before we start. So if you're 66 feet below the sea and you're looking up, all of that water above you is really heavy, right? If anybody's picked up at least a bucket of water, you know that water is heavy, but when you're underneath the water, you don't feel that weightlessness because you're weightless. But we use that same pressure that you would feel under a certain amount of seawater inside of a hyperbaric chamber, no water involved in the chamber, I promise, just air simulating the pressure that you would feel under 66 feet of seawater, 33 feet of sea to water, or at sea level, we have what's called one to ATA. So just from definitions, three ATA, 66 feet of seawater, uh, I can do this right here. Two ATA is um, 33 feet of seawater, and then one ATA is equal to sea level. So most of us were close to sea level here. That's where we are, okay? And if you go into, high, into a plane, an airplane, so this is an extremely high plane, but I don't know if most of you know, if you've ever been on an airplane, you feel that pressurization, that's because you're pressurized to 8,000 feet above sea level when you're on an airplane. And when you're at 8,000 feet, you're actually getting less oxygen up there. And that's one of the reasons why you feel worse when you get to your location. Other than food, the bad coffee, the time zones, but the oxygen is important too. All right. So really simple. When I, when I, get, when I want everybody to remember, we're just using oxygen and pressure. So we're going to go over oxygen first in, in detail because most of us know a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about pressure because that's what's most important actually in combination, why hyperbaric therapy works. All right, so oxygen. So we know, most of us know probably that oxygen is usually carried on red blood cells. 
We have red blood cells that go throughout our body. That's what makes our blood red. And it actually gets redder when hemoglobin, which is the molecule on oxygen, binds oxygen. And each hemoglobin molecule can bind four oxygen. We actually can carry about one billion oxygen molecules per red blood cell when it comes down to it. And that sounds like a lot, and it is. And that's how we usually get oxygen from our lungs, where we breathe it in, to the rest of our body to maintain all of our physiologic functions, whether we're giving a talk and making our brain work, or we're running and our muscles need to work, or whatever. Our body is this amazing triage system where we can actually get oxygen where we need it to anytime we need it. And, but most of us do a really good job carrying oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body. Has anybody used a pulse oximeter before on their femur, finger? Everybody knows what a pulse ox is now because of COVID. But before, I used to give this talk and nobody knew what a pulse ox is. <laughs> but so if you put a pulse ox on your finger, which is in this diagram over here, um, over here, you can see that it says 97%, 97 over there. So most of us do a really good job getting all the oxygen we need on those red blood cells and carrying it through the rest of our body. Most of us are 97 to 100% saturated. I've already told you, and you guys have heard, I'm sure, that hyperbaric oxygen therapy is getting more oxygen in the body. Well, how can we do that if it's already 97% saturated, right? So there's a couple ways to increase your oxygen carrying capacity. So the, the easiest way, the one that everybody knows about really, is from people like Lance Armstrong and others, by increasing the number of these babies in your bloodstream. So you can do that by taking a drug called Epigen. Everybody heard, anybody heard of EPO before? So that's the drug that all the cyclists would take and other people that would take because that would increase their red blood cell number. So the number of red blood cells you have goes up, the number of oxygen sites to bind goes up too. But you don't have to be like Lance Armstrong to get the benefit of hyperbaric therapy because there's another way. And that's by using pressure. <clears throat> so I don't know if my music's gonna play, probably not, right? Okay, that's too bad. I have a great song here. You can probably tell who's, who's singing it. Under pressure, uh, Freddie Mercury and David Bowie. But so pressure is the key to how hyperbaric therapy works. It's something called Henry's Law. And Henry's Law states, um, this is physics, the only physics, I promise, this is it. Um, the more pressure you put on a gas, the more of that gas is gonna go into liquid form, okay? So we already know that those red blood cells are saturated with oxygen already. But this plasma, this is the liquid of your blood. It's like, it's like a saline solution. It's a solution where everything gets driven from place to place. It's kind of like water, but with kind of like salt water. There's very little oxygen in your plasma at baseline. But when you combine pressure with the oxygen, you can drive up to 1,200% more oxygen in circulation. Okay, 12 times more oxygen. So you can't do this just with breathing an oxygen mask alone because you don't have the pressure. It's the pressure that does this, drives it in. You see all these little red balls. This, imagine this is oxygen, okay? More oxygen in your bloodstream as a result. So that's a massive amount of oxygen that you're potentially able to, to carry as a result of pressurizing a chamber in this case. Interesting little tidbit here is that at three ATA, whoop, wrong button, sorry. At three ATA, which is 66 feet of seawater, you no longer need your red blood cells to maintain your physiologic function, which means that we can saturate so much oxygen in your body that you don't need red blood cells, okay? Now, I don't recommend that <laughs> for anybody, okay? But in acute trauma, <clears throat> excuse me, acute hemorrhage, loss of blood, this could be a temporizing technology. You put somebody in a hyperbaric chamber, you can save their life. If they're a Jehovah's Witness and they don't accept blood transfusions, this is another way to save their life. So it's a massive amount of oxygen that's going in circulation. You guys with me so far? Everybody okay? All right. All right, so you have all this oxygen in circulation, right? And then what happens is there's an acute infusion of all this oxygen, and there's all these immediate effects, which are pretty amazing. Uh, the first one, is a constriction of blood vessels. And this may sound scary initially, but it's actually really important because you, if you have an acute trauma, you have an injury to a blood vessel, and that blood vessel is, is leaking out into tissue, it can cause a lot of inflammation, a lot of damage. So if you can constrict down that blood vessel a little bit, you can prevent inflammation, you can prevent swelling. So they did some studies on traumatic brain injury, and in a hyperbaric environment, you can decrease brain swelling and actually make people their survival much higher as a result of that. So you have to remember also, that we have so much oxygen in circulation because we just drove so much in there with the pressure that even though they are constricting down, you're still getting a lot more going forward. 
And then you increase the amount of oxygen in circulation, obviously, right? And by increasing the amount of oxygen, you're making more energy and you're, like, you're letting cells continue to make energy. So if you've had an acute stroke, you have a blockage of blood flow. Heart attack, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, acute trauma to a limb. If you can get oxygen into the system fast, you can potentially prevent significant disability. And there's good studies that show all of this to be the case. Of course, this is not your local hyperbaric center. Most of the time, this is gonna be an acute care kind of place, but it's pretty amazing what we can do. Decreasing, decreasing inflammation and pain, kind of a big deal. Inflammation is sort of the, the common denominator for a lot of different conditions. The release of stem cells. Stem cells are these baby cells in our body that can make any cell that we need to. And these are massively released and can go wherever they need to go to help with healing and recovery. Increase immune system function, killing bugs, especially bugs that do not like high oxygen environments, uh, help antibiotics work better, and actually enhance flow, blood flow into tissue, and lymphatic flow, which is like our garbage collection system in our body, help that work better too and help you detox. All right, so that's immediately what's happening. And now, what happens with an oxygen infusion protocol, which means going into the hyperbaric chamber for a successive number of days for various types of protocols, which I'll talk about, this not only has that, the benefits of the acute infusion, but also shifts how your DNA expresses proteins that are responsible for growth, for decreasing inflammation, regeneration, healing, and overall, what I like to call like rebuilding the architecture of tissue. This is the scaffolding of a building. So think about hyperbaric therapy as rebuilding that scaffolding from the ground up. New blood vessels, new nerve cells, new bone, new cartilage, new any type of tissue that you can imagine, okay? Um, this is one of my favorite buildings, actually the La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Spain, if anybody is interested. Um, so, new blood vessels, extremely important. So, if you get a lot of oxygen to, a lot of oxygen in the system and you get a lot of oxygen into tissue, you wanna make sure that's sustained over the long term, not just one time by getting a lot of oxygen in, the, in, in, this, in circulation because of being in the chamber. You want new blood vessels to form so that oxygen can continue to get to that tissue even after you finish your hyperbaric treatment. And this is angiogenesis anywhere you can imagine, in your brain, around your heart, for sexual function, your knee, I mean your toe, anywhere. And it's, and it's actually something we can measure and see, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, we can increase in antioxidants, which help protect us from inflammation. We optimize all stages of wound healing. So we just make wounds heal faster. We make wounds heal more efficiently. And we do this very quickly sometimes in the chamber, depending on the type of wound. Mitochondrial biogenesis, this means new mitochondria, new energy production organelles, these parts of your cell that make energy. Uh, we decrease inflammation. Hyperbaric therapy is as powerful as taking a steroid, actually in some studies shown, and we all know what we're using steroids all the time for inflammation. So decreasing senescent cell populations and telomere length, these are fancy words. What this basically means are these are two markers of aging that can be reversed inside of a hyperbaric environment. It's pretty cool. At least I think it's cool. But I do this for a living, so. All right, so um, this is a picture of a blood vessel that's blocked and the O's recommend are oxygen. These are the red blood cells in here, and O's are the oxygen here. So you have a narrowing in a blood vessel, okay? Um, the red blood cells can't get through, but the oxygen-infused plasma can. And as a result of that, all this tissue that would have died stays alive because it's getting oxygen as a result, okay? This happens immediately once you go into the chamber. Pretty amazing. And then over a protocol, over multiple hyperbaric dives, Together, you can rebuild the blood vasculature. So this is called angiogenesis, or new blood vessels, going around the areas of blockage. So this is called collateralization over here, okay? And you get these new blood vessels that go around, and so that tissue never died because you got into a hyperbaric chamber, you prevented it from losing oxygen flow, and then you gave it time to create new blood vessels that would go around that blockage. So this is how... In a nutshell, hyperbaric therapy can work in a lot of different ways with healing wounds. It just creates the ability to rebuild that architecture as we were describing, as I was describing, excuse me. All right, so the first type of chamber we have on the market is something called the multi-place chamber. And this is a chamber where multiple people can get treated all at the same time. You see, everybody's got a little oxygen mask and 
you know, tied up in, in here. There's about 12 people in here at a time. Um, this is at a facility in Israel called the Segal Center for Hyperbaric Medicine. This is where I, I, I visited in 2018. And these guys have a 10,000, at that time, they had a 10,000 person waiting list for their chamber. And the reason is they have a very massive research program and a reverse aging program. They don't call it anti-aging, we call it reverse aging. These were reversing markers of aging. And I asked the Israeli clinician who runs the place why they didn't call it anti-aging. And in a very Israeli way, and I can say this because I'm, I'm Jewish, he says to me, Scott, we reverse their age. That's all he said, and then that's all there is to it, right? So you look at the brain, it regenerates. You look at the heart, it regenerates. And so that's why they have a 10,000 person waiting list, probably longer now. I'm sure it's longer now, okay. Um, so the second type of chamber that was developed is called a monoplace, and this is what they have at Swanson. Um, does anybody know the most famous occupant of a monoplace chamber? You can just say his name if anybody knows. All right, Michael Jackson. So if you're born, I think before 1980 or so, you know about Michael Jackson getting filmed in these things. One more, look, actually, the one he was in looked more like this, actually. Um, and Michael Jackson actually got a lot of bad press about this, but he was using it. If you remember, he was really burned badly in a Pepsi commercial back in the 80s. Third degree burns, so he actually bought a chamber for his house so that he could heal from the third degree burns. And when he was finished with the chamber, he actually donated it to a local burn center in LA. So the monoplace chambers are the most common chamber that we use outside the hospital. Um, and they're very versatile. And you have some really nice ones here at Swanson. OK, so <clears throat> the hyperbaric experience. So this is my fun attempt at an animation. Okay. Um, so as I said, there's monoplace chambers, like single occupancy, multi-place. Here we have monos. So the other thing we talked about a little bit already is oxygen. So you're usually getting oxygen either ambiently so that the whole chamber is filled with oxygen. So the Swanson Clinic has those. Um, others have face masks like that multi-place chamber. You're getting the oxygen in the face mask. And then others have a hood where you wear this thing that looks like a condom on top of your head. And uh, that's what it looks like. It's true. Anybody seen Naked Gun? Just kidding. That's really old. Okay. All right. Okay. Man, I have a couple of people that saw that movie. That's great. Okay. So the idea is that when you're going to hyperbaric chamber, you start at sea level. And then you dive down to a certain amount of seawater, OK? And as you can imagine, if you were scuba diving or diving under a pool, you don't go from 0 feet to 30, 33 feet in a second. It takes time. And as you're going down, you're going to feel ear pressurization um, like you were on a plane or a train, you know, that popping sensation. Very, very easy for most people to tolerate. And you always have a technician outside the chamber to make sure you're OK. But you want to make sure you're continuing to decompress your ears as you're going down. So watch my little secret agent man. He's going to go down here. He's going to go down. He's going to stay at the bottom for a bit, and then he's come back up at the end. All right. So when he's coming down, or she, uh, the ears are going to be popping. When you get down to the bottom, you're just relaxing. You can watch movies. You can sleep. You can meditate for the time that you're down here. And then at the end, you come back up. Um, coming down, sometimes a little bit more difficult than coming back up. Um, but usually very tolerable for most people. 95% of people have no problems at all. Um, and it's, if any, anybody's been you know, deep down in a pool, they've felt this sensation. If they've scuba dived before or been on a plane, I'm sure all of you have heard, felt the popping sensation before. So, um, so that's your experience. It's a very comfortable experience. The temperature can sometimes change a little bit because pressure and temperature are, are inversely related. So you'll have blankets and things like that to keep you warm. But it's a very comfortable experience. All right, so we're going to go on to some indications here. So um, there are 14 indications in the United States that are approved by our insurance companies. Uh, the five here in blue are the ones that you can treat outside of a hospital, OK? So delayed radiation injury, the first one. These are patients that have had radiation treatment for cancer, mostly, most likely. And they've had an injury because of the radiation that's lasted a period of time after the radiation was given. Uh, most common in prostate cancer. Uh, breast cancer, uh, ear, nose, and throat, ear, nose, and throat, head, and neck cancers, and brain cancers. They get radiated. They can, a lot of times, unfortunately, these patients, or fortunately, the patients don't have any more cancer, but they get significant injuries as a result of the radiation itself. So hyperbaric therapy is a fantastic architecture rebuilder. It rebuilds with stem cells, blood vessels, the connective tissue, the cells that have, that have been depleted because of radiation. Uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, 
they heal these. I've had patients you know, come in with amputations and then we save additional digits and they ask me why they didn't get referred over to me earlier for their other amputations. So it works quite well. Uh, refractory bone infection, sudden hearing loss. These are in patients that lose their hearing. Uh, we think it's either autoimmune or viral and it does really well if you get really, get these patients in the chamber really, really fast. Uh, flaps and grafts are typically in plastic surgery. Um, and the other ones, I hope you guys never have to hear about, really, to be honest. They're all pretty nasty. But these are things that we see in the hospital. It's where I trained. I, I trained seeing a lot of this, uh, necrotizing soft tissue infections. You, you probably have heard of flesh-eating bacteria. That's what this is. Um, that's what got me so excited about hyperbaric therapy, actually. What could actually happen because uh, of being in a chamber. I saw people that were going to get all of their limbs amputated, um, only get one amputated instead. Well, I mean, and that's a huge deal, of course, right? And so I saw people that were with carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, where is it over here, um, go into chambers that were on ventilators and then walk out of the chamber 90 minutes later. So it's just amazing what oxygen and pressure can do. And that's what got me excited. I mean, I didn't give you guys my background, but I'm an internal medicine physician, but I grew up the son of a chiropractor. So I didn't know what a box was. I didn't know what conventional medicine was until I went to medical school. So, and my goal was really to figure out a way to kind of bridge that gap. And I, and I found that through hyperbaric therapy because I found out there was all this amazing work that was being done in this country and others and how you could utilize oxygen and pressure in a lot of different ways. Um, so we're using it. So yeah, this is a picture of me. I'm working on something called the VO2 max bike. This is, a, this is when I was in Israel way back. And optimal performance is a big category of things that we're doing. So we know that if you go into a hyperbaric environment and do a protocol, you're gonna increase your VO2 max. You're gonna increase your ability to use oxygen on a minute to minute basis. You're actually increasing the density of blood vessels around your heart. Um, also working with things like, I mean, uh, exercise recovery, exercise performance, jet lag, even hangovers sometimes, although we don't advertise that usually. So, um, And then we're doing a lot of work in the regenerative medicine anti-aging world or reverse aging. And I'm gonna show you some slides on that in a minute. Uh, cancer synergy. So. Hyperbaric therapy is not a treatment for cancer, but it's a synergistic approach that can make other cancer therapies work better. It makes chemotherapy, radiation work better. Um, it helps you heal from radiation injury like we talked about and help you heal, heal from surgery faster too. Uh, we're doing a lot of great work in stroke, so patients post-stroke. Unfortunately, and I still work in the hospital part-time, we don't do much for patients with stroke. We don't, there's not much we can do, especially after about three months post-stroke. And so this is a fantastic technology to help people recover function and ability after they've had a stroke when, I mean, really, after three months, there's very little you're going to get back if you haven't gotten it back at that point. Uh, so RSD, or complex regional pain syndrome, this is a chronic pain uh, syndrome that can be very debilitating. Ulcerative colitis and inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, dementia, so Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, part, and uh, what am I forgetting, and vascular dementia. Um, these are all very sensitive and very responsive to hyperbaric therapy. Of course, it's not just, and it's important to always remember this, it's a treatment that's fantastically effective, but if you're drinking alcohol every night, going to McDonald's every two days, and you think that hyperbaric therapy is going to help your dementia, I don't think so, sorry. <laughs> so you gotta do other things other than just get into a chamber, but in addition to doing other work at the same time, it can be fantastically effective. Uh, doing amazing things in traumatic brain injury recovery, both in the acute setting and also in people with what's called post-concussive syndrome, people who have long-term symptoms that don't get better. Uh, Lyme disease, autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, MS, some really great data coming out with all those. Uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, pre-post-surgery. So we're getting people heal fast to heal faster after surgery. These, these protocols usually require a couple treatments before surgery, if possible, and then several treatments afterwards, but not that many. And you can see massive improvements in the efficiency of healing, anywhere between 20 to 70% 70, 70 faster healing. 20% if you're more on the sicker side and 70% if you're on the healthier side. So, but we're using it post-surgery from anything from hips to knees to rotator cuffs to abdominal surgeries, you name it. Any acute inflammation, any acute injury, no matter if a surgeon did, to, did it to you, or you got it on the soccer field, your hyperbaric therapy is gonna make it heal faster, which is what it comes down to. Uh, we're getting women pregnant. It's always a good thing if they wanna get pregnant, right, I guess. So, um, and so that's by, also, by helping with the fertility of the mom, but also with helping with the fertility of the dad, too. 
Um, there is some indication that hyperbaric therapy can make sperm function better. Uh, it helps with optimizing sperm function, as also the lining of the uterus for implantation. So a couple of you have probably heard of COVID-19, I'm guessing, at this point. Um, hyperbaric therapy is being used in the acute setting, not as much as I would like it because it's hard to do, but to prevent people from going on ventilators. Thankfully, hopefully we're past most of that now. But we're actually using it a lot now in the post-COVID syndrome area. And also in people that have had, you know, some people are having vaccine injuries that, that, actually, um, that actually present very similarly to how it would be if you were, uh, had a COVID-19 infection and had symptoms ongoing. So the data is still early here, but it's very, very, very promising. And there's about 25 more that I could talk about. But I'm going to go through a couple of slides just to kind of have some fun so you guys can get a feel of what we do in the chamber. Um, and then I'm gonna, I think I've got enough time if anybody has any specific questions too. So this, this was a study that was published, as you can see, in November 2020. And it was the first human study to show the reversal of the biology of aging. This is called the telomere shortening and senescent cell accumulation. So as we get older, telomeres are these ends of our chromosomes. They get shorter and shorter and shorter until the chromosome disintegrates, okay? And that's part of getting old. Your telomeres get smaller. Um, senescent cells, I like to call them by their other name, zombie cells, because that's great. My kids love zombies. Don't you? Um, so senescent cells over here, right? So we're there. Yeah. And zombie cells, they call them zombie cells because these cells don't divide and don't die. So typically what your body would do if the cell's not working so well anymore, it will establish a signal cascade that will make that cell die. And that's a good thing because when these cells stick around, they are responsible for and they're related to uh, cancer, autoimmune disease, aging, and death. So you don't want to have senescent cells is what it come down to, comes down to. And we all get these as we get older. So this particular study, um, they had a 20% increase in their telomere length, 30%, 37% decrease in senescent cell populations. So there's never been a technology so far that has shown anything remotely like this before. And that is extremely exciting. Um, this population of people were all over 64 years, of old, 64 years of age, but they were all healthy, okay? These aren't people that had multiple medical issues. Some of them were on medications, but nobody was extremely debilitated. So this is healthy aging, healthier reverse aging kind of idea. Um, what I love about this study on some levels is that they didn't change anybody's lifestyle or diet at all. And that's pretty impressive to me that they still saw these results. Just for me as an integrative physician, like, well, what if you actually did change their diet? What if you did change their lifestyle at the same time? What kind of results would you see? They use 60 hyperbaric sessions here, okay? Six, zero. So what I haven't, I think, hammered home yet is I talked about there's the acute infusion of hyperbaric oxygen, but there's also that, the benefits of this long-term oxygen infusion protocol, right? Those long-term oxygen infusion protocols are usually done in blocks of 20, 30, 40, sometimes as many as 60 sessions. And by block, I mean Monday through Friday, weekends off for that period of time. Because hyperbaric therapy works because you're getting an intermittent yet daily or five days a week infusion of that oxygen to change how your DNA expresses your genes. That's epigenetics, really. And so they use 60 in this, in this protocol. That's three months of hyperbaric therapy. That's a legitimately long time, no doubt about it. Um, I've seen a lot of benefits for people that do about 30 to 40 to have significant long-term benefits there too. Uh, they also did a study on brains. And so this is in healthy aging adults, seeing how blood flow would change in their brain after 60 hyperbaric sessions. It's kind of difficult to see, but if you look in these areas here, like here, I maybe think I have a pointer, yeah. Um, here versus here, and here, here versus here, but also like especially here versus here, you can see significant red, right? You see the red go up? That's all blood flow. So you know when I talked about all that oxygen going into the system? That's great, but what's really important is that you have sustainable blood flow in those areas over the long term. That's why it's not just getting oxygen in, into the system short term, it's long term getting those new blood vessels to regenerate the area, and now you have new blood vessels and new brain function, optimized brain function in those areas. 
And they also did cognitive testing with these people. And they also did quality of life scoring with these people. And, and they saw that they were all doing so much better. Does anybody know what a picture, this picture is of, by chance? Any guesses? What do you think? If you guess, 1,000 points. <laughs> Any guesses? Any guesses? Just, just yell it out. Spine. Spine, I like that. What's that? OK. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is a penis, OK? Um, and what they did is, this is a special type of MRI that actually measures blood flow. So in the previous one I just showed you, whoop, I think I go back. This is a blood flow scan. So this is an MRI as well, but this is not your typical MRI. This is an MRI that's measuring flow of blood and, as, and metabolic function. So this is not the one you can go get to, you'll get at the local hospital. These are specialized MRI scans that show blood flow. So what they did, and they published a study on this, and this is why, by the way, the, the doctor in Israel thought that, that, that they had a 10,000 person waiting list, is that they would sh they, what they did is they, they did an MRI of the penis before, an MRI of the penis afterwards, after, after 60 sessions. And then they showed this is the delta, the change between the two, OK? And, and also, clinically, they published a study on how hyperbaric therapy was giving men erections that weren't getting erections anymore. So we call it our oxygen-induced Viagra. You know, so. But so interesting, right? So, but what's important here, I mean, all kidding aside, is that if your sexual function is healthy, you are likely healthy or more healthy overall as well. So one of the first things to go, unfortunately for men, is sexual function if, they get, if they're not as healthy, especially if other medical problems like diabetes, for example. So next time you see a picture of something like this, you'll know. OK, guys? I won't be able to surprise you again. Um, the effect of hyperbaric therapy on mitochondrial function. This is your heart function. So improving vascularization, blood vessels around your heart, and improving the function of what's called your left ventricular ejection fraction, your ability to pump blood with each heartbeat. So pretty, pretty cool. And again, this is in a patient population of greater than 65 years of age. However, the same group in Israel is also working with athletes and seeing that you can increase their VO2 max. You saw me on the bike before, right? They'll put people on the bike before. They'll put people on the bike afterwards. And you can see how the minute to minute utilization of oxygen goes up dramatically. And that's because you've increased the density of these blood vessels around your heart. And the more blood vessels you have around your heart, the more you're able to get oxygen to your heart when you start you know, doing a lot of exercise. All right. All right. Um, traumatic brain injury. Um, I really wish I could have updated, updated this slide. I was actually going back through my slides, and I've had to use the same slide for the last five years because this is what we do for traumatic brain injury now. Um, this is our current paradigm. We acute hospital care, rehab, you know, job retraining, um, therapy, you know, cognitive behavioral support groups. Um, and then we have all these drugs that we use. None of them are FDA approved for traumatic brain injury, but we use them all. Um, antipsychotics, amphetamines like Adderall, um, narcotics, anti-seizure medications, sleep medications, antidepressants. So we don't really have any good treatments for traumatic brain injury is what it comes down to, even though they've tried. And you know, I was hoping in the last five years we'd have something. Um, I was hoping that would be hyperbaric therapy, to be honest, because we have a lot of great data that hyperbaric therapy is fantastically effective for these patients, both in the acute setting and also in the long-term post-concussive syndrome uh, timeframe as well. So, not too far away from you guys, uh, Sarah and Galen Roxwald, or I think it's the University of Minnesota, um, they've done some great work on acute traumatic brain injury. And they're doing a study right now, it's called the Hobbit trial. I like the name of that trial. Um, hyperbaric oxygen uh, for brain injury, hyperbaric oxygen therapy for brain injury um, trial. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy for brain injury trial, Hobbit. Um, anyway, so they published a study about five or six years ago that in severe TBI, these are in patients that are so injured that they need to be in, on a ventilator, they need to have holes cut in their, in their skull so that their brain doesn't, can swell, um, they have to be sedated. Just three hyperbaric sessions, the first three days, decreased mortality by 50%, 5-0. And 
decreased morbidity, which means disability, by about 40%. So significant improvements. And so right now they're doing a multi-center trial where they're doing these, this same protocol. And I'm really hoping that we see more benefit and get more people into these chambers faster yeah, for traumatic brain injury. Uh, we're also doing it all for post-concussive syndrome, though. These are in patients that have had a, a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, and still have symptoms three months later. And we used to think that this was very uncommon. Excuse me. But now we know it's extremely common. The New York Times did an article, uh, I think it's about three or four years ago now, and even one concussion when you're a teenager affects the rest of your life, the trajectory of the rest of your life. So it's, it's significant. And we know that a concussion is a wound of the brain. And what does hyperbaric oxygen therapy do? It heals wounds, no matter where they are. And so the way I like to think about this, and I'll talk about this with stroke as well, is that it's very difficult for the brain to heal because the brain is encased in this thing called your cranium, so it can't swell. It doesn't want to swell. And it's very easy for your knee to swell, but it's not easy for your brain to swell. And as a result, it's very difficult for your brain to heal after you've had a concussion, after you've had a stroke, or any brain insult. And so oftentimes people are left with post-concussive syndrome. Um, maybe it's not their first concussion, but their second one, or their third, and I'm sure you know many people, I know many, uh, that have had multiple concussions, right? And sometimes, at some point, they, read, they reach this kind of like threshold, and then their brain stops not working as well as it did before. The amazing thing about hyperbaric therapy is that we can regenerate the brain. You saw that already in the, in the aging population. We can do that in patients with traumatic brain injury. These are my best saves, by far, that I've had throughout my career. The 14-year-old who got injured skiing, wouldn't leave his room, was depressed and trying to kill himself, and after a period of hyperbaric therapy, was back to school, wasn't depressed, was fine. You know, like, and that was like two months later. And I've seen this time and time again, especially in, in, in young people, but even in, 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 in adults as well. Even in veterans that were in the Vietnam War. I remember one veteran that I treated, he had PTSD and traumatic brain injury. He woke up every morning because of nightmares, night terrors. Um, after, I think it was about 10 hyperbaric sessions. This is Vietnam, okay? We're talking about 25 years, 30 years before. He stopped having nightmares, and they never came back. And, I mean, something like that, like, you just can't say anything to it. I mean, he was like, you know, thank you for giving my life back. I mean, it's been 35 years of nightmares. I got divorced. I've, you know, everything else as a result of everything that happened. So um, that's the other thing about this, is that it is better to treat these things early but even 25 years later, I've seen significant benefits for people that have had brain injury. So in this particular study, they looked at people that had a concussion and were still symptomatic one year out. The possibility that you get any improvement after a year is zero, okay? And they had, and in this particular trial, they had significant benefit, significant. And they did imaging to show you that the brain, I don't know if I have a, uh, so what's here, what do I got here? So, the best place to look is probably the cerebellum here. You see, this, in this particular individual, the cerebellum is all white, right? And, uh, and then afterwards is, is all red here, okay? So the increase in blood flow. And then also um, on top of the head, on the sides here, in the front. So this is not, yeah, that's, those are not the best images, actually. But, but you can kind of see it over here, too. This is probably better. So like on the inferior side, so we have a lot of like crevices and bony parts in the bottom of our, our skull. And so this got all knocked up, and this is after hyperbaric therapy. Like that's, like all that turning red is pretty amazing. So, and this is not just while you're in the chamber, this is after you get out of the chamber too, this is sustainable, okay? So really doing some great work with post-concussive syndrome. And stroke as well. And stroke is pretty, it's pretty dramatic because you have these areas of the brain that just don't work. And so this person, that's where the, the stroke was right here, okay? Um, but you have to think about it, right? So you guys have all, you guys live near lakes, right? That's what Minnesota is right next door. If you ever have a still lake and you throw a rock into it, you have a direct impact of that rock, but then you have all the ripples around it, okay? So imagine a stroke is, you have a direct impact, which is around, which is here. Whoop, sorry. Uh, which is here. But then you have all the ripples around it, which is all 
the tissue around the area that, that's dead, is the tissue that's dead is not coming back, but all the ripples around it are all tissue that's been insulted about injured but not dead. And you can actually rebuild that tissue and see regeneration, okay? So you can see how, you know, even there are some areas that are still green, but look how much has come back, you know? See that? Like that's a huge amount of tissue that's, that's, I'm getting my feedback. That's coming back after hyperbaric therapy. Am I still on? Yes? Okay. Um, so this, these protocols were 40 sessions long, four zero. And Monday through Friday, weekends off, five days on, two days off for that 40 sessions, okay? So significant stroke recovery. These are people that, um, I mean, it can be significant in the sense of improving motor function. Like you can't move your arm, you can move your arm. Or you couldn't move your fingers, you can move your fingers. And we're not talking about you know, amazing cures all the time. Sometimes it's just a matter of how much more function you have. Can you wipe your own butt? That's kind of a big deal, right? So if you, could, you couldn't do it before and now you can do it, that's a big improvement to your quality of life, even if it's just that. I mean, just to kind of give it to you like on a, like a very specific, I, I mean, I had a patient like this, right? She was still grateful to me because she couldn't do it before and now she didn't have somebody else, have to have somebody else do it to her, right? So that's a big deal too. So, um, so stroke recovery is a real big one. And as I was mentioning earlier, the conventional world that I'm in has very little to offer after about three months. Even after the first 30 days, there's very much, very little that we can do, um, really after the first 12 hours, to be honest, okay. Um, after that, it's all what, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen, so. Um, all right, and then over to performance. And so um, I work with a lot of athletes. I work a lot in the, in the optimal performance space. Um, I, look, I work a lot with CEOs and all those kinds of people too. And what everybody wants is better recovery, better performance, brain performance, um, workout recovery, I talked about VO2 max a little bit before. And so hyperbaric therapy can do all of these things. It can help you improve just workout recovery. It can improve injury recovery too. So if you've had an injury, getting in the chamber is gonna make you heal faster, plain and simple. Bone healing, ligaments, soft tissue, everything. So one of the, the, some of the first players I used, uh, used, to play, used to treat were some of the baseball players get those Tommy John surgeries, you know, so they can continue to, to pitch. Those guys would come in the chamber, their recovery time was half. I've had work with athletes that have had Achilles tendon tears and sprains, you know, half the time to recover. So it, it can be ex extremely significant. And sometimes it can do it better than the body will do it on its own, especially if there's other complications re related to the healing process. So, and then surger surgical recovery, I did talk about a little bit, but we, again, we're just revving up the whole process of healing. If if I was gonna give you a couple things to remember from this talk, it would be the two things that hyperbaric therapy, the two things that are required for, to make hyperbaric therapy work, oxygen and pressure. And then what does hyperbaric therapy do? It heals wounds, no matter where they are. Doesn't matter where they came from, that's what, the, what it's gonna do. That's, if you remember any, nothing else, that's probably the best thing to remember. So, um, and maybe what a penis looks like with MRI scanner. Okay, all right, okay. And these are some of the studies on inflammation and exercise recovery um, and also bone healing, et cetera. So I won't go into all this stuff, but just to say that, I'm not just saying this stuff, okay? There's research that's behind everything that I've been talking to you guys about today. And more of that research is happening all the time. Uh, unfortunately, in the US, hyperbaric therapy is, the educational part is not there yet. That's what I've been trying to do. and but the power of this technology is, is unquestionable. Um, final thing I'll talk about, and then I'll answer questions. Actually, I'm gonna do some safety stuff real quick after this. Um, the final condition is long haul COVID syndrome. So um, does anybody know somebody with long haul symptoms? Raise your hand. Yeah. See, almost everybody does. And what we think is happening is that these patients probably weren't healthy or as healthy as they could be before they got COVID. Not always, but most of the time. And as a result, their body's inflammatory response doesn't completely shut off once the COVID infection is resolved. And there's inflammation, there's hypoxia or low oxygen state. All of us know about that pulse ox because of people's oxygen levels going low during COVID. And so what hyperbaric therapy can do is reverse that low oxygen state. We already talked about that. That's easy. I've seen people do three sessions in the chamber with shortness of breath or low oxygen levels and they're good. And, 
and is actually really surprising to me um, to see how quickly people actually can, can recover. Now, this is all anecdotal data so far. There are a couple case reports that have been done, some studies that are being done now, but we're also decreasing inflammation. And what's happening with a lot of patients is that they're getting brain fog, they're getting a lot of fatigue, it's a lot of inflammation. So as soon as you can bring down, the, down that inflammation, the body starts healing itself. And I've seen this, how many patients myself? Probably 50 patients myself now, and then over the, around the country, I speak to clinics all the time, you know, at least 1,000 patients overall that we've heard of getting better using hyperbaric therapy. So again, it's still anecdotal, but the physiology makes sense. You're, we're decreasing inflammation, we're reversing low oxygen state, okay? We're helping with stem cell release. We're, you know, we're, we're really helping with immune system function as well. And so, and we're also helping with what's, what's, what's called neuroplasticity, which is over here. Well, I press the wrong button again. All right, there you go. Uh, neuroplasticity. That's a fancy word for saying that we can help the brain rewire itself. If you've had an injury and some of your brain has been injured, whether from COVID or a stroke or a TBI or you're just getting old, you know, and parts of, the, parts of your brain start deteriorating as we get old, um, the idea is to rebuild the architecture and then rewire the brain so it can work as maximally, as optimally as it can. So that's what hyperbaric therapy can do. Um, all right, so yes, it's very exciting what we're doing there. And then safety-wise, a couple things. I talked about your ears already. So you have that, uh, your eardrum needs to be able to decompress itself in the chamber. Uh, real easy to do for most people, just like if you were on a plane or a train, as we talked about. Um, eyes, if you have cataracts already, your cataracts may grow faster inside of a hyperbaric environment. They won't make cataracts suddenly appear, but they may, get, they may grow a little faster inside of a hyperbaric environment. Not usually a big deal, but just something to keep aware of. Um, if you're congested and have any like sinus issues, it can be difficult to clear in the chamber. So that's, if you've ever been on a plane with a cold, you know what I'm talking about. It's that, you know, that's feeling that's not so great. Um, and then if you have a cardiac function that's less than, if, you're, if your heart doesn't pump more than 35% each time, that can be risky. Um, if your lungs, if you have any of these, if you have severe asthma, mild asthma is fine, but these other ones, you just have to be a little bit more careful. But you have some great, uh, Swanson's got some great techs that have a lot of experience and uh, really know how to address all this. And um, if you have a history of seizures, uh, we wanna make sure that your seizures are controlled. Under hyperbaric conditions, you have an increased risk of, uh, or a decreased risk of, um, let me say that one more time. Your seizure threshold goes down, which means that in people that are susceptible to seizures, you could potentially have one in the chamber, but it's extremely, extremely rare. And you, we hardly ever see it because it, we have various ways of, of mitigating these kinds of things in the chamber. Um, I've only seen one in 10 years. And the tech here who's been doing this, what, 40 years or something, he's never seen one. So it's very, very uncommon. Um, so these are the reasons why you don't wanna go in the chamber, okay? Um, so if, you have, if you're pregnant, um, although we've treated pregnant women in the, in the past, with carbon monoxide poisoning, you're not supposed to go in if you're pregnant. Now we're trying to, if we're trying to get you pregnant, that's fine, but you can't be pregnant, okay? All right, uh, fevers, a higher risk of, uh, of inflammation and, and having uh, complications. If you, if you have COPD and require oxygen, if you have a lung that's dropped and not working, go to a hospital, uh, you won't be coming to the hyperbaric clinic. Um, uncontrolled asthma, you just wanna make sure your asthma is controlled. If not, it can be, you can get more reactive airways in, in, your, uh, in, in the chamber itself. I already mentioned this before. Now, this is usually an issue for some people, but only if it's really bad claustrophobia. Because you're inside of, an, you're inside of a chamber. The Swanson chambers are the biggest chambers I've ever seen, actually. And they're all translucent around them. So you can see out in 360 degrees, which makes it very, very rare that you'd have a feeling of being claustrophobic. But some people are. But we can usually give meds, if that's the case, too, to relax you. But in general, very few people have the, a, a difficulty unless you're severely claustrophobic. Um, and then of course you have to be able to follow directions, right? So, um, and be able to communicate with the person outside the chamber so you can tell them how you feel. What I always tell people is that, um, I go back to this patient, that hyperbaric therapy should be a very comfortable experience for you. It shouldn't be painful, it shouldn't be uncomfortable. Um, and if, there, if it is in any way, you really need to tell your technician outside the chamber that something's amiss. You know? There's no toughing out hyperbaric therapy, unfortunately. You know, people will, will tell us, like, after the fact that their ears hurt, we want them to know, we want us to know, tell us if you're having any issues so that we can help along the way. 
and the technician's always outside the chamber with you, you can always communicate with them. All you need to do is talk, and they'll have like a walkie-talkie phone kind of thing to be able to talk with you. So it's very safe, it's very comfortable. I like to say hyperbaric therapy is safer than taking an Advil, really, as long as you screen people out appropriately. So, um, and that's what the technicians are for, that's what the, the hyperbaric doctors are for, is that we make sure that you're safe. But if you're safe to go in, it's very safe, very comfortable, and you know, extremely therapeutic under a lot of circumstances. So um, that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Go back to any conditions you want, want me to talk about. Um, I hope that was helpful as an overview of hyperbaric therapy. Just remember, oxygen and pressure heals wounds anywhere. That's it, okay? Thank you. <laughs>